Good afternoon, folks. Tim Radford here on WKRK 105.5 FM, 1320 AM, cable TV, channel 25, worldwide at WKRK.love. Our guest today is Dr. Karen A. Davis. She is a board-certified general practitioner, and she has the areas of expertise, primary care for infants through adults, women's health, including routine uh, exams and some specialty procedures, screenings, health maintenance, management of chronic diseases, and just welcome Dr. Davis. How are you today? I'm doing well. Fantastic. Well, let's see, I'm looking at my uh, watch now. It's August 12th for the date, and August is National Immunization Awareness Month. What would you like to tell our uh, viewers out there today about the importance of immunization? Well, immunizations are designed to assist us in fighting off things that we have availability to bump up our immune response to. So many people express concerns to me that they are weakening their immune system by getting an immunization, and it's actually the opposite. Our immune system has a variety of things that it does, responds to inflammation and infections, it responds with extra blood cells when we're stressed, it responds when there's an invader, which would be hopefully an infection, but occasionally it's an autoimmune disorder, which is kind of a whole nother ball of wax. We're familiar with those perhaps as rheumatoid arthritis mm -hmm. or diabetes, but those things we don't have immunizations against. We can prevent some bacterial infections, pneumonia from a particular group or family of bacteria, we've got pretty good immune protection for. We do that immunization for children, generally before kindergarten, to help them not have as much susceptibility to, thing, to the bacteria family that causes most of their ear infections, throat infections, and nasal infections. Small children don't have sinuses yet, but they can get some pretty nasty upper nose infections that make them very ill and can cause a lot of problems. Um, th mm -hmm. Go ahead. That this time of year, I think many people are thinking of is it's almost time for the signs to go up at the pharmacies that the flu vaccine is in. So a couple of points on that regard. Chances are the signs are not going up in the pharmacies in the next several weeks. Our pharmacists in this pandemic are amongst our most protected healthcare providers. While they are taught to immunize and do a great service to the community, we don't have any backups for them if they were to get sick. Mm -hmm. So they are our most socially distanced healthcare providers right now. They will be immunizing again, but we're not quite sure when. So this season, at least to begin it for influenza, we will be immunizing in physicians' offices and the county health departments. Okay. I know that uh, there is a, uh, a growing anti-vax movement out there, and I understand the importance of vaccines being in Rotary International. At one time, we had a serious problem with polio in, well, yes. worldwide. And uh, back years ago, we have, well, we now have a campaign called In Polio Now. We're down to two countries, which are Afghanistan and Pakistan, oh, where great. that uh, is the only time the only cases that we know about in the world now, but at a while, a while back, it was a serious problem, even here locally. And then yeah. Rotary was one of the driving forces to, we want to vaccinate everyone in the world so that they do not get this horrible disease. So right. I do understand that importance of uh, vaccinations. I do have the, the, the thing on my arm that shows that I got the, the vaccine and now it's actually just drops on the tongue. It, they've yes. come a long way. Um, it started out as oral, so I, I was born in 1957, my older brother in 1955. We lived in Boston, Boston metro area for a little while when my dad was on sabbatical back at Harvard. Um, and I remember vividly as a little tiny person going into the school auditorium or cafeteria actually mm -hmm. to be part of being immunized. My mom was an RN and it was then drops on a sugar cube. And which seems like that would be the perfect way to give something to a child, except I was a child who disliked sugar, so I wasn't going to take it. It was actually very memorable to my mom and to me. What kid but, like sugar? <laughs> but I understand. And I still don't. Um, so oral vaccines are 
live vaccines. So we've heard a smattering about herd immunity with the new concern to develop a vaccination and help protect population. So the concept behind herd immunity is you give a very small dose of the active infecting agent mm -hmm. and then the person who gets it sheds it when it's a virus and exposes their surrounding contacts to teeny tiny doses which allows our immune system to have a finite amount to mount that response so it's like making little replicas of something that can contain the virus so the, the way that i've explained it to people over the years is if you're old enough to remember the fisher price toys there was a cube that had different holes in it that were different shapes. Mm -hmm. So that kind of idea, if, the, if we can have something that's got a shape that fits it, the virus can be put inside and held captive. Okay. So I know with COVID-19, we're several months into this now, and that seems to be a part of our daily life, our daily conversation now. A lot of people have put off getting proper care for their health. So yeah. what are some of the key reasons that somebody needs to be current, especially right now uh, with COVID-19? So because we have, as Dr. Rubendahl said in his interview a few weeks ago. I'm sorry, go ahead. Uh, someone's as Dr. Rubendahl said in his um, interview a few weeks ago, the SARS family of viruses is not new to us. This particular strain. So the coronavirus has been around for decades. We've had it as part of the common cold, all sorts of things, but we've never had a vaccine for it. What the benefit of having vaccinations against other, especially respiratory things. So for children, that would be RSV and um, adults, it would be the pneumonia vaccine if they're qualified age-wise and condition-wise, as well as the influenza virus vaccination, that frees up our immune system to be able to mount a much better response to a different invader because it has in reserve those utility players that can come in for those special purposes. Aha, the system um, you know, announces an incursion from influenza A or B, and we've got those players in reserve, we can put in that team. So it gives us more A teams. How far are we along in the process of developing a, a vaccine for COVID-19? Is Are we close? So there's a couple vaccines that are out in a test population, which as most of the time for vaccinations is healthy, relatively young, that definition changing as we all age, because mm -hmm. now someone to me that's in their 40s is young, because I'm in my 60s. But. <laughs> <laughs> um, and the first set of testing is, does the vaccine make them sick? Does it make them feel lousy? Do they have funky reactions to it that we had no idea might happen? Because live things are very different than testing it in a petri dish mm -hmm. or a little test tube? Does it attack the virus? Does it kill it? Does it hold it captive? Does it dismember it? What does it do? And then after that, we try to have test subjects that have been given a small amount of the virus and then give them the vaccine and then see if the vaccine does anything and then do it the other way around. Give them the vaccine and then give them the virus and see if the virus then does nothing, which is the hope, because it can't. So some vaccines can actually fight to annihilate a virus, and so can be given after the fact. Rabies vaccines, you're given it after exposure. We aren't given prophylactically rabies vaccines. People who are animal trainers, perhaps, but not the rest of us. So we're hoping that those studies go smoothly um, I understand that Russia has introduced a virus, a vaccine that's going to be given to the population, which while interesting and hopeful, may not have the best data that comes back to us on the actual results. And we've had vaccines in the past that had really unexpected, pretty difficult responses and are responsible for many of the reasons that we have on the vaccine permission slip that everyone signs and may not read 
odd sounding things like Guillain-Barre syndrome, which can be a result of a vaccination or an infection. Okay. So it's not lightly done to mass vaccinate because you can't take back a shot. Right. Absolutely. Make somebody puke up a pill, but not so much a shot. Right now we're here. Here we are in uh, almost the middle of August. Kids are going to be going back to school very, very soon. And uh, we realize that kids are not having the same effects to COVID-19 as the older population is. So we have the kids going back to school. The teachers are adults. Some of them are older. The kids go back home to their parents and grand grandparents. What are your recommendations as kids return to school for both kids and the adults that uh, are around those kids? So being the child of two teachers, educating people has always been part of my outlook on life. Mm -hmm. And if people understand that what they do affects others and can act accordingly and you morph that into whatever situation they're in. So if you're at school and you're touching the desk and you're touching writing implements and you're touching a computer screen that someone else may have touched, most likely will have touched if it's a school computer, doorknobs, toilet seats, all the things, then wash your hands in between. Before you touch you with your hands, wash your hands. So it isn't that you can never touch your face again, but where were your hands right before you touched your face? And do you want that on your face? And same with touching someone else. If you're going to be touching Gran, wash your hands first. Make sure that you're not wearing the clothing you were out and about and hugging and goofing around with your friends in because there may be something on that clothing that will bother Graham. All right. So the kids will be wearing masks in school. Uh, our government has uh, given five masks uh, per each student. So the temperatures will be checked in the mornings. And um, right. so I know there's a lot of precautions being taken as far as uh, um, the athletics. There's a new athletic calendar now that is proposed and football is not actually starting until February. So I hear which in Colorado wouldn't go well, but where I have lived for the last 35 years. But here, having been here through February, it will kind of work. All right. So women, uh, a lot of times, will put their families first and delay their own care. So yeah. what kind of advice do you give to women? And what needs to be done? So an annual exam for a woman includes the general expectation on my part of doing a head-to-toe exam. So head, eyes, ears, nose, throat, skin, heart, lungs, do a breast exam, do a belly exam, do an internal exam, and make sure I don't find anything that doesn't seem ordinary. And some total, it's about 45 minutes of my time with her and probably just over 70 minutes of her time getting into the office, getting checked in, getting all the pulse, blood pressure, checking to make sure that her height's the same as it was last year, wait so we can make sure that there isn't an inordinate gain or loss that could indicate that there's something else going on that I might need blood work to look at. And I try to make that a fairly compressed focus on that person time so that any changes from the year before would be obvious. That's a little more challenging for me since I only started here in January and many of the patients that I'm seeing weren't part of the practice before. So I don't have that year look back oftentimes when I'm first seeing the patient, but I can get records and make a comparison and then loop back if there's something that seems quite different. Generally, I start out telling the patient that my hope is that this will be that she is boringly normal and she'll just go out and have a nice meal because she came in fasting and carry on with her day. Because that's the point is to have nothing out of the ordinary happen. It's a well woman exam when you came in and you're a well woman certified when you leave. Fantastic. I know those key, key screenings are very important and the follow up to those very important too. So some folks also are concerned about going into a doctor's office, going into 
the hospital right now with COVID-19. But from what I've heard, that is a very safe place to be. Can you elaborate? Yes. So our exam rooms are relatively routinely cleaned, but a routine cleaning in a medical exam room means that after the patient has walked out, and this is before COVID was part of an issue, the door handle is wiped down by our staff outside door handle, inside door handle with a surface cleaner. The exam table, the paper is removed that the patient had been sitting on and the entire exam table is cleaned with the same thing, a surface wipe, which does kill bacteria and viruses. We have virucidal surface wipes. And the staff wears gloves when they use those because they're not meant for skin contact. Um, they wipe down the surface of the counter where I may have laid something down and picked it up. They wipe out the interior of the sink. I wash my hands when I come in the patient room. I clean my stethoscope every time before I use it to touch the patient. I clean it before I leave the room, and then I'm cleaning it again when I walk in the next room, just in case something happened to it in between. It lives on my shoulder, so and I don't change my lab coat in between. And I know from having made my students do it, because I was made to do it when I started as a doc wearing a lab coat, to run a roller down my lab coat after every patient and roll it across a petri dish, a dish that we grow bacterial stuff on, and see what grew by 48 hours from the first patient, the second patient, the third patient, the fourth, however many through the end of the day, wow. proving that it was wise to change my dang lab coat every day. Yeah. <laughs> and I did the same to my hands. Oh. So it was before the era of antibacterial soap and pretty much Lister proved it in the 1870s. Soap is antibacterial. So very good. I know we're right now we're viral as well if it's liquidy enough. Right now we're hearing constantly the three W's uh wash your hands, wear a mask, and wait six feet away from each other. So, so social distancing is a very important thing right now, and it's probably one of the most overused expressions uh mm -hmm. Since COVID nineteen happened, but why why is it important? I know uh, I tried to relate. A lot of people are trying to compare this to the flu, but when a person has the flu, you can see on their face that they're not feeling well, and you automatically socially distance yourself because you know. But with COVID, it's kind of invisible for some. Well, influenza, you're contagious before you're symptomatic, mm. so. I think I'm probably pretty good after almost 40 years of being a physician of telling when someone just doesn't feel right. Even if I've not seen them before, sometimes it, they look like they have a headache and I couldn't describe to you what that looks like, but I've gotten pretty good at it. But before you become symptomatic, you simply are asymptomatic mm -hmm. and that doesn't have a look. It looks like a person. What kind of time for the even with chicken pox and I'm of the age where this was a phrase we no longer use, which is usual childhood diseases because we've got immunizations for most of those now and chicken pox very contagious. I tried to explain this to one of my medical students 20 years ago. I had a child that was in that clearly had chicken pox. I know what it looks like. I had had it. I've seen it for the years, but it was becoming less common. And he wanted to see what it looked like. And I said, I don't want you to go in the room because you have a nine month old child at home and she doesn't need chicken pox. And he goes, well, I'm not going to touch her. And I said, it doesn't matter. It is that contagious. We will be cleaning the room top to bottom and scrubbing out the air vents, <laughs> which is not fun after this child leaves. I'm not going to treat her like she's a pariah now or make her mom any more worried about her having chicken pox. But no, I don't want you to go in the room. Well, he wanted to see what it looked like and he didn't touch the child. He stood probably three feet away and looked at the little spots so he knew what they would look like. And two days later, his daughter had chicken pox. I know it used to be common practice for parents to have chicken pox parties. Yes, I went to one when I was. To one. Is that common practice now? Or uh, now that we have the vaccine, it probably is. Not. I haven't seen a case of chicken pox in years. Okay. I don't think that my, the gal who is my first partner in medical practice is 15 years younger than I am. And I am quite certain she has never seen a case of chicken pox. 
Okay. What is the, the condition later in life for someone who had gotten chicken pox or who had not gotten, but there's like a something right now that shingles shingles. That's the word I'm looking for. What is so we used to think it was um, a different virus in the same family. So it actually was give the virus that was identified was given a different name. And then as science got better and we were able to look at viruses better under electron microscopes, it was discovered that it was the exact same virus. So that virus is now called varicella zoster. So it's combining the two names, varicella, what we used for chickenpox, and zoster, what we used for shingles. And it's in the herpes family of viruses, like the viruses that cause cold sores, mm -hmm. and we never rid ourselves of them. So the immune system sequesters it after we've had our crop of chickenpox lesions that are itchy, stingy, and widespread. I still remember my brothers calling me Spot. Um, <laughs> brothers. They're so great. And it comes out of that enforced dormancy or jail and is, was held dormant in a nerve root and affects that nerve root. So that's why it comes in a stripe. The name shingles actually comes from an old Greek word from ancient Greek that meant scarf because it's a stripe. And we have nerve roots that cross every part of our skin, but most of them are from the nape of our neck, the bump at the back of our neck, down to just above our tailbone because we have more vertebrae and nerves come out by vertebrae. So just numbers game, most of the shingles outbreaks have to do with our torso or perhaps our limbs. The most painful and debilitating ones are the ones that have to do with our facial skin. And the one that is the worst is the one that encompasses both sides of our eyebrow and comes in sort of a odd Indian war paint sort of stripe down and to the tip of our nose and we can get them inside our eyelids. Wow. On the skin of the inside of our eyelid. So those often hospitalize people and because of the extreme pain. It's, it's not itchy or stingy, it's burn painful and that pain, that nerve root irritation, although we can weather through and push back on the skin reaction by some medications, we don't take care of the pain with those medications. And many of them require opioid medication and the ones across that particular part of the facial nerve, it's not uncommon for someone to be hospitalized and put into a medically induced coma to allow them to weather through the worst of the pain. Everyone that I've known who have had shingles, they talk about that pain. It's horrible. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, changing gears completely. I know whenever we go to a healthcare provider, we fill out the paperwork and there's just a lot of questions on that. And what it always on that paper is asking about family medical history. Yes. Why is it important? for people to know their family medical history, because I don't always know what to put in that blank because I haven't really talked to my family about their, their medical history. So things like cardiovascular disease, while it sounds like, well, that's just heart trouble. It isn't really. It's both the blood vessels, so the vascular part and the heart. So the heart is a muscle, it's a pump, and it has nerves and it has blood vessels that supply it and it pumps blood into blood vessels that supply everything else. And those things are mechanical to some extent and affected by other things. Mm -hmm. So if you have a family history of heart disease that involves having stents put in arteries or having artery bypasses done, then it's entirely possible that you have a family history of cholesterol abnormalities. And that's often an abnormality of the carrier proteins for cholesterol or that your body makes cholesterol robustly. What the cholesterol that we eat is broken down as any other fat, it's a type of fat, and then remade by our body according to the blueprints that we inherited from our parents and from their parents. So if you have, as I do, a family history of high cholesterol, during the years that I was menstruating, I had more estrogen, and that is somewhat of a protective factor. We don't know exactly why, 
It doesn't work to add it later to make it protective. It's just, and maybe it's the time frame in which it's made and it doesn't have anything to do with cholesterol, with the estrogen. We don't know. Um, we'll find out eventually, but right now we don't know. And that means that as I get older, that blueprint is more and more likely to be obvious. So my cholesterol, I don't eat that differently than I did 30 years ago, but my cholesterol is a little higher than it used to be. It isn't as high as either of my brothers and both of them take medication to lower as does our dad. And my mom never had that issue, but she had the issue that her father did, which was late in life as a very slender fit man, he became a diabetic and one very difficult to control with oral medication. And my mom's wasn't difficult to control with oral medication, but I'm waiting for that to be an issue for me. And my mom always said to me that it was interesting how little I liked sugar. I avoided eating it when I was a child. I cried when the doctor gave me a lollipop when I didn't cry after my shot because <laughs> I thought I had to eat it because he gave it to me because he's the doctor. And she wondered always, she died several years ago, if I would become diabetic late, later and this was part of something in my system trying to protect me against that by not eating extra sugar. Wow, that's interesting. I'll well, check back with you in 20 years. All right, I'll be here. So uh, I know our time has gotten away quickly. You're just so easy to talk to. Uh, okay. So I do want to just talk about managing medications. I know in my past, uh, I would go to my general physician and get a medicine and then I had to go to a dentist and get another medicine for I think it was a combination between naproxen and ibuprofen or something like that so mm -hmm. there really wasn't a way for a good communication back then and I found out later that those two were maybe it was yeah those two weren't good to mix together no not so much so what how has that improved as far as communication with health records and medication well, some of the electronic record has been a big boon there, um, and it depends on the electronic record. They aren't all created equal. There's something called Health Information Technology HIT, and there's a HIT certification that any of the records that are used widely now have to meet certain criteria, but they're perhaps not as detailed as some of us would like on the user side. So. The one that to me is the most helpful medication wise is presuming that the patient patient goes to the same pharmacy or the same pharmacy company. So maybe a CVS when you're on vacation or at your winter home as all, and also a CVS, but in another town when you're at your summer home. That helps because CVS is linked electronically and that record pops up for the pharmacist and oh you're taking this this may not be a good medication combination let me call your doctor before i fill it in or let me call back this prescriber and see or the patient can say oh but i don't take that anymore and it was never discontinued in the system right so that helps um, it gets a little confusing because there's two routes for a message to come to the physician for three actually for a refill being requested the patient the pharmacy can directly set up to ping the electronic record and then it just comes through the record and not bypass not to the patient not to the mail order not anything and that has gotten very confusing with the mail order pharmacy world and I can set myself a reminder that when the patient's current amount is up, before I refill it, I want this lab work. And that is still carries the old phrase of a tickle file because files used to be in a loose paper fashion in a drawer and you would flip through with your finger and they called it tickling. Okay. Well, very good. And anyone, I know there's a lot of information online too, as far as medical, uh, your interactions, you can probably plug in your medications and see how they interact with each other. I've gone to a site too, that, yes. that, that was helpful for me. So, but again, I, I just want to say thank you so much for taking the time to be with us today. Is there anything that you wanted to talk about that I haven't asked about? 
So I think another thing that's been sort of bumped around and doesn't quite make sense is a patient-centered medical home, another cumbersome name made up by somebody who doesn't practice medicine. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that's something that has a certification that allows us to be registered as such. But the idea is that we, as the providers, there are two nurse practitioners and myself at the Hayesville office, have interaction amongst ourselves so that we can cross cover. The electronic health record helps with that. But our purpose is to have the patients be able to come to one place and sort out what might be best to do next instead of, well, I just saw my cardiologist and I just saw my pulmonologist and she wants this lab work and he wants this lab work and I need to understand why and what's going on and do they talk to each other and why are you on a medicine that might make the heart stuff worse or your thyroid worse and that gets really tedious and hard. <laughs> so having a patient-centered medical home where it automatically notifies the cardiologist that this is where the patient is seen for their routine medical care makes an avenue more likely that I will be able to communicate with that doc. And I have a file that tells me that I ordered lab work, but I don't have a report, which leads me to believe that the patient didn't have it drawn yet. And we can set up that recall system, reminding the patient because sometimes when you're walking out of the appointment with a list of things to do, you're on your way to work and that is already intervened and that piece of paper is probably somewhere, but not necessarily in the tip of your brain anymore. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for being with us. I'm going to let folks know that your office is located in Hayesville on Highway 64 East at 146 Highway 64 East in Hayesville. And uh, for anyone who wants to schedule an appointment with Dr. Davis, the phone number is 83, no, 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 828-389-3608. 389-3608. And we're right place. next to the Huddle House and the Ingalls. Sometimes street numbers don't pop out at you when you're driving at 50 miles an hour on a four-lane. So I think everybody in Hayesville knows for where a Huddle House and Ingalls are, so right there. So thank you so much for being with us today, and I hope you have a great rest of your week. Thanks, you too. Thank you. Bye-bye.